group of people we have to speak with you tonight. First is uh, Dr. Tom Broker, as Annette mentioned. He's a research geophysicist at the USGS. Their office is less than a mile from here on Middlefield. Uh, uh, he was the director of the Earthquake Science Center, and he is an expert in seismology, earthquake hazard assessment, mitigation, and preparedness. So his talk will be, I think, very salient. Remember, the problem we have as humans is that we tend to only be able to really focus on one thing at a time, and we're susceptible to manipulation. The news media, certain politicians, right? They make us pay attention to things that may or may not be important. Earthquakes, unfortunately, are always important to pay attention to. Next up, we'll have Jeff Norris. Jeff is a, a colleague of mine in the OES structure, the Office of Emergency Services. He is part of our neighbor to the north, the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office of Emergency Services. And he's been there since 2004. He's also been with their search and rescue team way back, 1978. He's got, obviously, a vast wealth of experience and knowledge. And today, he's going to focus on just a little bit of that, which is notification, the use of social media tools, and high-tech ways that we can all stay informed. And uh, we really appreciate Jeff being here tonight. Finally, uh, Brandon Vaughn is our third speaker. And I've talked mainly about him already. So in addition to running the emergency management team at Stanford Healthcare, which is Stanford Hospital, the Children's Hospitals, and what is it, 148? 198. 198 locations, I keep adding to the locations. That's a lot of locations. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, he is with DMAT. He's also been an emergency medical technician and a certified EMT since 1995. He's been on deployments at a lot of national and international disasters, including some of the famous ones, Hurricane Katrina being uh, one, and I'm sure he's gonna throw a few little war stories, as we call them, uh, in, in the mix. When we're done with the panel, uh, if, if you can, please stay. We're going to have our new police chief, Robert Johnson. Bob Johnson is over there. And our fire chief, Eric Nickel, my colleagues in the public safety team, they're going to kind of provide some uh, closing remarks, and we're going to leave here a little after 9 p.m. So with that, I'm going to take my seat up there on the dais, and we're going to run through the presentations, have a little bit of interactive Q&A, and move off to the chiefs to close us out. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. I'm Tom Broker with the USGS, and I, I've been asked to tell you a little bit about earthquakes. And I wanted to, first of all, let you know there's a couple of handouts on the table over there. One talks about what we can expect in the next 30 years in terms of earthquakes, and the other talks about earthquake early warning. And I'll be talking about both of these in my talk. And I'll also be talking quite a bit about the Hayward Fault and the 1868 Hayward earthquake, and I'll tell you why during the talk. So this, this slide shows you the arrow is the timeline of the earthquakes in the Bay Area starting in the gold rush in 1850 and moving to the right. And so you can see the big dot is 1906, magnitude 7.8 earthquake. And you can see all the little dots before that. In the 50 years before the 1906 earthquake, the Bay Area had a big earthquake, a magnitude 5 to 6, even a 7, every few years. So the Bay Area really knew that it was earthquake country. Look what happened after 1906, very few dots. So 1906 was such a big earthquake that it's really uh, released most of the stress in the Bay Area. And so we've had very few big earthquakes since 1906, the biggest one being in 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, the dashed horizontal line it shows you the, the magnitude of uh, the level of damaging earthquakes, which is about a magnitude. We don't get terribly excited in my profession until we get about a magnitude five and a half or six. That's when we really start to see some damage. Whoops. I don't mean to scare people. And the next slide is something, it's a slide that's familiar to every geology student who's ever taken Geology 101. And the reason it's familiar is that uh, it's used to show the offset that was produced by the 1906 earthquake. And you can see this fence line, and I think this is up in Marin County, this fence line on this farm. Uh, one side of the fault moved the fence about 10 feet north of the other side. And geologists ooh and ah about that. But what I want you to put, what I want you to notice are the buildings in the background. So here we had these buildings, and we had the big 
big San Andreas Fault, big magnitude 7.8 earthquake in this person's backyard, and their house and their buildings look fine. So that's why I think experience has shown that most of us are not even going to be hurt by the earthquake, but we need to take some steps to, to help that along and to, and to recover faster after the earthquake. This map shows the Bay Area. The red line on the left is the San Andreas Fault. The red line on the right is the Hayward Fault. You can see Palo Alto down at the bottom of the map. The, the little yellow areas outline the areas that were populated back in 1906. Okay. So you can see there wasn't much on the peninsula. And now the gray area shows you where we are now. So back in 1906, nobody lived on the fault. Now we do. Uh, population's about 10 times higher than it used to be. And our hazard in Palo Alto and along the entire peninsula is high because we live so darn close to the San Andreas Fault. OK, so the, the one handout is, uh, shows you a couple of the figures are from this handout that gives you the update for the next 30 years. The map on the left is a map of the Bay Area, and the little dots, which you probably can't make out here, are the earthquakes in the past 40 years. These are all the magnitude twos and about above earthquakes. Most of these we wouldn't even feel. But you can see they do a, a very nice job of delineating the earthquake faults in the Bay Area. So the earthquakes are happening every day in the Bay Area. The map on the right shows you our estimate of the chance, of the likelihood, of a damaging Loma Prieta type earthquake on each of these faults in the next 30 years. So you can see in the San Andreas Fault, which is our neighbor here, it's about 22% chance in the next 30 years. On the Hayward Fault, it's more like a one out of three chance. And the Bay Area wide, uh, it's about a three out of four chance. So if I, if I went to Vegas, which I don't, but if I went to Vegas, those are pretty darn good odds. I would take those odds, right? You would win some money taking those odds. So we're pretty good odds that we're going to have a damaging Loma Prieta type earthquake in the next 30 years or bigger. Here's an expanded view of that, just to kind of focus on the central part of the Bay Area. And you can see uh, Palo Alto. So you can see how close we are to the San Andreas Fault. We're very close to the Hayward Fault. We're sort of between them. And the big, thick colored lines are the major earthquake faults in the Bay Area that we think can produce a magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquake, damaging earthquake. But the little yellow lines are earthquake faults that are active as well. And they can produce magnitude sixes and maybe six and a half earthquakes which don't sound like much, but ask the people in Napa what a magnitude six earthquake can do. So those can also be very damaging locally. So we have a couple of those that are near Palo Alto around on the peninsula. So if those were to rupture, they would locally cause a lot of damage. So why am I going to harp so much on a Hayward Fault? Well, the last earthquake on the Hayward Fault was 150 years ago, in 1868. And at that time, it was called the Great San Francisco Earthquake because it damaged San Francisco and it kill, killed people in San Francisco. Um, uh, the missions were started in uh, 1776 or so in San Francisco. And before that, we have geological evidence of 12 earthquakes in the past 2,000 years. The past five earthquakes have been 155, reading along the top here. Uh, two of the earthquakes were 155 years apart, two were 160 years apart, one was 95 years apart, and another was 143 years apart, and now we're 150 years and counting. So it's, we're in the window where we can expect the Hayward Fault earthquake, which is, there thought to be on the order of a magnitude 6.8, 6.9 uh, magnitude earthquake. And the 150th anniversary will be on, uh, this year on October 21st. 
So this uh, map shows you the shaking levels that were produced by the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And I'm wondering how many people were here for the Loma Prieta earthquake? Quite a few, okay. So you remember the level of shaking that you felt, and you can see the color code here. You, you can find where you were. Most of us uh, really experienced what we, what's labeled here light to moderate levels of shaking and didn't really see very much damage. Um, you can see because the, that's because the, the Loma Prieta earthquake ruptured in the Santa Cruz Mountains to the south. So it's actually not very close to us here. The 1868 earthquake, in contrast, is going to be in the, or was in the center of the Bay Area. And you can see, uh, we think it ruptured the black line that you can see along the Hayward Fault in the East Bay and, prob and uh, probably ruptured near San Leandro. We're not quite sure where the epicenter was. But you can see there was very strong levels of damage in San Leandro, Hayward, Fremont. But also there was, you can see kind of orange colors near Palo Alto. So we will, we will expect some fairly strong shaking here in Palo Alto due to that Hayward earthquake. Now back in 1868, this top picture shows you what San, San Leandro looked like in the 1860s. About 500 people lived in San Leandro. Now we have about 100,000. Um, so uh, the picture in, in, the, in the top shows you the whole town of <coughs> San Leandro, and I've, I've illustrated the courthouse. San Leandro was the county courthouse back in the day. And you can see the inset shows you the damage that was produced by the earthquake. So the damage to San Leandro was quite considerable. Uh, we are also learning that earthquakes don't necessarily go one bang and they're done. What we learned in the South Napa earthquake a, a few years ago is that the show may not be over. And on the left side, I show you the crack that was produced by an earthquake, the earthquake, and you can see the striping on the road is offset a little bit. And the picture on the right was taken the next day, and you can see that offset has grown. So even though it didn't produce a large earthquake, there was still, the fault was still moving for days after the earthquake. In fact, in some places it was moving for months after the earthquake. So we could have infrastructure and buildings and so on built on top of the fault or that cross the fault that are okay the day of the earthquake, but might rupture or have even more problems in the days following the earthquake. So that's something that we'll have to pay attention to. And we think this is potentially uh, going to happen along the Hayward Fault. One of the reasons we think that is that on along the Hayward Fault, we're seeing this constant motion, steady motion along the fault uh, with that, without, in the absence of large earthquakes. And this shows you a curb that was initially, that curb would have joined up nicely with the rounded part of the curb, but the steady motion along the Hayward Fault has shifted the curb about four inches over time. So we know the fault is moving. And most of us know, most of you know about the San Andreas Fault, which produced the 1906 earthquake, and it also produced the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. The 1906 earthquake, we think, ruptured off this San Francisco Zoo offshore, just a couple of miles or so, and it broke both to the north and to the south. And this is a shake map, and you can see that the strong shaking occurred along the entire north coast of California. So even though it's called the San Francisco earthquake, it really shook up all of Northern California. In fact, the strongest shaking and, and damage and fatalities per capita was in Santa Rosa. Uh, but it's not, we don't call it the Santa Rosa earthquake. So let me talk about one of the, one of the things we're doing to help mitigate earthquakes. Uh, so we're developing a system called earthquake early warning Sometimes facetiously, I call it earthquake last warning, because it's based on a premise that the earthquake has started. And so on the lower left, 
you can see the earthquake is started by the star, and the earthquake has produced two different kinds of waves. And the first waves, the fastest waves, come to us first, and those don't shake as hard as the second waves, which do the damage. So we can locate the earthquake using these first fast traveling waves, and we can uh, detect where it happened and how big it was, and we can relay that information uh, electronically ahead of, the, ahead of the earthquake and thereby get some seconds of warning. Um, what it depends upon is having these sensors, I call them tripwires. We need to have lots of tripwires on the ground to detect the earthquake, and then we can uh, determine where the earthquake was and broadcast that information ahead of the earthquake shaking. Now that tripwire system in Japan, the Japanese have a similar system, and it's been uh, working for now, I think about 10 years. Um, and you can see the density of tripwires in, in Japan, all those little orange squares are their sensors. And in contrast, you, at, at the same scale, you can see the sensor network in California. And it's very good in LA area, and it's very good in the Bay Area, and it's not so good anywhere else in California. So the, the issue, we need, uh, our sensor network is only about half to maybe uh, two-thirds built. Uh, and so we need to keep working on building out that sensor network. So let's talk about the Berkeley earthquake from a couple of weeks ago. It was about a magnitude 4.4, and that's about, the, that's about the size of earthquake that we think we'll give, start giving warnings for. So this is a shake map. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this is a did you feel it map. So about 40,000 people went onto our website after the earthquake and filled out the did you feel it. And so you can see it, the earthquake was felt from north of Santa Rosa all the way down to Monterey and even a little bit farther south and as far east as Sacramento. So it was a very widely felt earthquake even though it was not a very large earthquake. See, it was in Berkeley. So what, what kind of warning would, would we have gotten from this earthquake? Just to give you a little background, so uh, here's an expanded view of Berkeley. The earthquake uh, epicenter was actually by the Claremont Hotel, if anyone knows the Claremont, or the Caldecott Tunnel. It's in the epicenter, if you just south of the campus at UC Berkeley. And then in that area, these other dots show you the, uh, the uh, previous earthquakes of, of, of about that magnitude that happened. And in that area, for reasons that we don't really understand, there's been a, a series of earthquakes. In that, in that region. But to move on to the earthquake early warning part, um, and so, so the epicenter was in Berkeley. The, the green circle shows you uh, where we would have uh, received about 10 seconds of warning. Uh, so in Palo Alto, we would have gotten about 10 seconds of warning from that earthquake. Uh, and that's just uh, that's about as good as we can do based on the physics of earthquakes and the, the speed that the two different waves uh, travel at. So if we had an earthquake, you can see that if we had an earthquake closer to Palo Alto, we would just move those circles closer to Palo Alto. So we we're going to have less than 10 seconds of warning for earthquakes that are closer to Palo Alto. But, um, there's a lot of applications that can use even a few seconds of warning, and BART is already using the, what we call the shake alert, the earthquake or the warning system, to slow down trains. And in 10 seconds, BART can slow down a train by about 30 miles per hour. So you can imagine that that will, will help reduce the casualties uh, related to earthquakes and trains jumping off the tracks and that sort of thing. And so they're already using shake alert uh, right now. Uh, we are working with other groups. Uh, I believe we're working with the Menlo Park Fire Department on automatic opening of fire doors at uh, fire stations. So that uh, when earthquakes happen and you get a lot of shaking, what can happen is that door, uh, door frames get out of true. So it can, can be difficult to open the doors after the earthquake, so 
that's an application for doing something before the earthquake is actually struck, opening the doors so that the trucks can get out more readily. And so we're working with uh, Menlo Park with that, but uh, we're looking, uh, I, I, I'm sure we'd be happy to work with Palo Alto as well. Um, there's a current snag uh, with earthquake early warning, and that is that most of the federal and uh, cell phone providers in the U.S., the, the uh, federal alert system, the Amber's alert, they're not designed to operate instantaneously, within seconds. And so they're not capable at the current time of pushing out earthquake notifications, earthquake early warning system. But, and that's because they've never had an application before that needed it. But they you know, now they recognize the need for it. And so they're both the federal system and the cell phone providers are working on solutions to the issues that they have uh, to do that. But one of the things uh, I'd like to emphasize in, in all the talks that I give is the reason that we teach drop, cover, and hold on. And that, that is, the reason is that the, the two ways you're most likely to be injured in an earthquake in California is that in a strong earthquake, you're going to be pushed down to the floor. You're going to be pushed over. And so a lot of people get injured falling over and hitting the, the ground. So that's why you drop. As soon as you feel the earthquake, you drop down in a controlled way so you don't get injured. The second thing, the other thing, the other way you get hurt in California is that things start to fall on you. And so that's why you get underneath something that's going to give you a little cover so that those things don't land on you and, and hurt you. And you hold on to that thing that's giving you cover if, it's, if it can move. Because we know in 1906, the shaking lasted for 45 seconds, and all the furniture in the rooms just walked around the room. So if you're not holding on to that thing that's giving you cover, pretty soon you're not underneath that thing. Okay? So you've got to hold on to that thing and make sure you stay with it. And every year we teach this drill statewide and actually nationally now and internationally in something that will shake out. It's always the third Thursday of the month of October. Uh, um, and this, this year it's going to be on October 19th at 10, 19 a.m. So that's a very, really good way of practicing, okay, how do I drop cover and hold on? And, and also to practice other things you want to practice for your earthquake drill. The other thing I want to just chat or just talk about briefly is that we know that building retrofits work. And uh, the reason we know that is that uh, we and that the, the new building codes work because in Japan, where they've had some really large earthquakes, the new building codes have done really well to protect the new buildings. But the issue that we have is that a lot of our buildings are older and they weren't built to the current building code. But we know that it's possible to retrofit older houses and there was there's a property owner in Santa Cruz and for whatever reason they bought two of the identical houses next to each other in Santa Cruz and they had retrofit one of the houses before the Loma Freighter earthquake and the other house they hadn't retrofit so the house that was retrofit and they were identical houses they were exactly the same house um, the one that had been retrofit did really well in the earthquake and had little minor damage, maybe a few thousand dollars worth of damage. The other house practically fell apart and required hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair that house. So we know that retrofitting can work and it can really prevent a lot of damage. And what it can do, in addition to saving you money, it gives you a place to stay after the earthquake so that you can shelter in place. You don't have to be evacuated. You don't have to leave your house, where, which after all, is where you have most of your resources. The other thing I'm going to just encourage you all to think about is that in addition to uh, retrofitting, think about your chimney. The level of shaking that I showed in those shake maps 
um, level of shaking, intensity seven, intensity eight, that's when chimneys start falling down. So that's what we're gonna see in a Hayward fault kind of uh, earthquake in Palo Alto. So if you have a chimney, you can be proactive and have it replaced by a chimney that's metal pipe and wood frame. And so that's not gonna fail during the earthquake and it's not gonna potentially fall into your house and cause damage or cause your house to be red tagged after the earthquake so that you'll have to leave your house. So, and the other sales pitch I'll make is that it's gonna be a lot cheaper to do that after the earthquake, I mean before the earthquake than after because everyone is going to be trying to find a contractor to do some work on their house and it's going to be very expensive to have any work done on your house. So again, you could, if you do it now before the earthquake, you can schedule it at your convenience and you probably pay less money to have that done. Um, the USGS, and we have some of them here. We have these uh, guides for preparing for the next earthquake. They're in English uh, as the putting down roots in earthquake country, but they're also in Spanish and uh, Chinese. Vietnamese and Korean. Um, so we, and these are all available online. Uh, and again, they talk about, one of the things they talk about is the seven steps to earthquake safety and preparedness. And four of the steps are things you can do before the earthquake. And it's things like securing your space, making sure that things are not gonna flood, become airborne and land on you during the earthquake, making sure your hot water heater is well strapped. Uh, developing your plan to reconnect with your family and loved ones after the earthquake, organizing your uh, disaster kit, uh, emergency kit that includes your med prescription medicines, as well as plenty of water, uh, because our water comes to us from the Sierras and crosses three active faults to get to us. It's always good to have a little water on hand. And uh, you can do, as I said, you can retrofit your house. And the picture there on the lower left, lower right corner shows some workmen under in the crawl space of a house. And basically, if you have a crawl space or a garage and you can see two by fours, that's a great target to put up some nice plywood. And uh, that's called shear walling your house. And that will make that, that wall and that much stronger and much more resistant to failing in earthquake probably save you a lot of damage to your house. And it's not very expensive. So I think I'm just about at the end. So yeah, so we're definitely an earthquake country. Uh, we have a history of damaging earthquakes in the Bay Area, but we know now that we can prepare for earthquakes. There's no need to be a victim. You can get ready, you can prepare your house and your family for an earthquake and you can uh, you can uh, take this step now and you'll be uh, uh, much better prepared to recover from the earthquake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. We will transition over here to Brandon Bond, who's going to give us an overview of uh, things that he does and yet another great picture in this slide set. So thanks, Brandon. Yeah, let's. Uh... Welcome everybody again. So listening to some of these conversations, it, it gave me several thoughts on uh, some different ideas and stories and pictures that I wanted to share. Uh, so I'll try to inject some of those things. Uh, but let me first start off with saying, uh, Ken Duker, I'm, the, I'm Brandon Bond. Um, this is how we're gonna connect in a true disaster. So now that we, yeah, everybody see what happened there? All right, face to face. Um, little, little story, so. Right after the eye of Hurricane Maria passed over San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, our team was launched out to start doing assessments of the hospitals. And uh, I was on a small uh, uh, five person team and the first hospital that we got to was in an area of town that uh, did not have any cellular coverage. The hospital had lost all their communication systems, they had lost power and their backup generators had failed. Uh, for a hospital, that's a very bad uh, situation and condition to be in. Um, so uh, while the team went inside to start the assessment of their needs, um, we had some immediate information of the number of patients, how many patients were on ventilators, how much backup battery they had, and uh, I was tasked with getting a hold of our overhead command team and 
relay that we have a dire situation, send all the help you can. So I have my incident action plan and my satellite phone and it's raining a little bit and I call the first number and it just kind of rings. I call the second number and I get a voicemail. I call the third number and they're like, hello? Hello? Can I, can I, can I hear you? And, and I'm just, I'm getting frustrated here, right? And, and then I, I call my buddy Brian over here because I know he's going to answer and he's like, I can hear him. Wait, wait, slow down. Hang on. I got to get something to write with. And, and I, honestly, it was something out of a movie. Absolutely something out of a movie. The bottom line is Murphy comes to every party, right? So just remember that. And uh, while the mayor said that she would not have you stand up, I am not running for re-election. Um, so there may be some interaction parts involved with this, okay? So I'm Brandon Bond. I'm the administrative director of the Office of Emergency Management for Stanford Healthcare and Stanford Children's Health. I also wear some other hats with US Health and Human Services, the safety officer for the team. And I'm a canine handler with San Mateo County uh, Sheriff's Search and Rescue. Um, that being said, while I'm sitting here in uniform this evening, uh, this presentation, uh, does not express the views of the federal government. I have nothing to disclose. Um, and these are uh, just based off of my own anecdotes and experiences throughout the, the years. So in terms of our disaster, and it's important to think about this, right? Our disaster here in our community. There's always that notion of it's not if, but it's when. And even the, the picture on the top left corner of the flooding, that is the basement of Lucille Packer Children's Hospital in 2011. Mm -hmm. And that, that consumed half of the city's emergency response resources uh, that evening. So the bottom line is stuff happens. So we have to be ready to go in our community. And as emergency planners, we cannot prepare you for a disaster. Only you can prepare you for a disaster. Right? So with that being said, imagine if you're sitting here this evening or at your work and we just experienced that 7.2 earthquake. Roads are down, communications are limited, and we'll say for this scenario, you're all at work. Okay? And some perspective based off of the USGS presentation, when we responded to the earthquake in Haiti, we experienced two aftershocks that were 6 point plus. So just some perspective on that. All right, so here we go. It's game time. Okay, go ahead and stand up. It's, it's, you've been sitting for a while. This is a good little, uh, good little stretch break. Good little stretch break. Okay, interactive part of the game. All right, so you guys are already sitting, so that's yielding. You're going to forgive the prize. Okay, remain standing if, remain standing if you have an emergency kit at home. All right, good to be expected of this room. Remain standing if you have a communications plan with your family. Uh-oh. Okay, we have some homework to do. If you have enough water for your whole family for seven days at home. Okay, a little more homework to do. If you have an out-of-state contact that your whole family will call in an emergency where cell service is out locally. Excellent. You have an emergency kit at work. Okay. If you have a plan for yourself and your family so that you could stay at work for three days. Pretty good. Okay, so for final jeopardy, final jeopardy, remain standing if that emergency contact number is memorized. <laughs> All right. So, very good, excellent. There's some wonderful handouts and refreshments for you afterwards for participating. Uh, so we, even as a room full of emergency preparedness junkies, we all have a little bit of work to do, right? There's always something that we can do to be better prepared while the hospital is calling me about an emergency. Okay, I don't have to respond to that one. So a little bit about the 2017 hurricane season. Uh, this picture is phenomenal. When was the last time we saw three hurricanes simultaneous in the Atlantic? I'm pretty sure it was called a movie the day after tomorrow. <laughs> and, and as with uh, the new technology, you can see just below uh, where it says 65.8 degrees, the little purple dot, that's my location sitting with all of these folks here and 35 other of our team members with a storm bearing down of 165 degrees 
165 mile an hour and 200 mile an hour plus. Absolutely phenomenal. You could feel the pressure of your ears getting ready to pop. So timelines of events, and this is a, a, a bit hard to see on the screen, but um, again, DMAT CA6 is a uh, federal emergency response team under United States Health and Human Services. We all have day jobs, but then when a major disaster hits, we get called up to serve as a medical response team, um, very similar to uh, military reserve, except that we are um, civilian uniform services. So. Um, our team works on a rotational period in terms of on-call months, and August, we were not on-call. So, you know, we were relaxed in steady state. Uh, but Hurricane Harvey came into Texas. Um, many of the teams in the system got deployed, and a lot of the teams needed additional uh, staff. So we sent about 13 of our team members to go help support other teams in the nation to Texas with Hurricane Harvey. Um, Missions ranged from supporting evacuations to medical shelter missions. And as Hurricane Harvey grew, more and more teams across the nation were getting de deployed. And at one point, um, over half of the deployable DMAT teams, and there's 52 in the nation, um, were operational in Texas. And we had been put on alert. And for three days, I had to drop my kids off at school, kiss them goodbye, and say, I may be going to Texas today because we literally were that close to getting launched to Texas. That weekend on September 4th, there was this little storm starting to churn called Irma. And the pre-deployment model for hurricanes, if there is a category three hurricane or above that's threatening the continental United States or its territories to automatically start pre-deploying assets into that theater of operations. Well, in this case, everything was committed to Texas and the Gulf states. So one, uh, a FEMA incident management team and a health and human services incident response coordination team, all those acronyms, and one DMAT got sent to stage in Puerto Rico ahead of Hurricane Irma. And so our first task was to prepare to ride out this category four or five storm. That was our first mission set. One, one, one DMAT, three hurricanes, we called ourselves the Atlantic Task Force. <laughs> so immediately after the eye passing with Hurricane Irma, uh, we were launched to the U.S. Virgin Islands to St. Thomas to Schneider Regional Medical Center. Uh, this is a hospital that is uh, equivalent to hospitals in, here on the mainland. Um, it is accredited by Joint Commission, just as we are, uh, but they had lost their watertight roof membrane. And you're in the tropics, and it's a hurricane, it rains. Um, so they immediately started evacuating the hospital, and uh, we came in, supported the evacuation, supported augmentation of their emergency department, and then we partnered with uh, US military to build a alternate uh, field hospital, and we worked to identify all of the hemodialysis patients in the Virgin Island territories and evacuate them to Puerto Rico. Uh, and then finally, our mission was starting to come to a close. And some of our team members started to deploy home. And then here comes another hurricane called Maria, a bigger hurricane. So the decision was made that all US federal personnel were going to be evacuated out of the Virgin Islands back to Puerto Rico. That was the longest eight hour day that I've ever had sitting in an airport with no air conditioning and full uniform. We thought we were getting on a C-130, but the plane broke down and we were literally hitchhiking, waiting for a ride. So anecdotally, we finally got onto a 737 that was chartered by FEMA to fly us back to Puerto Rico. Now, all of the uh, civilian uniform responders have federal law enforcement force protection. We don't move without a federal law enforcement officer in full tactical gear with us. That is really a, a lesson out of Hurricane Katrina. And so here we have this airplane that's full of federal response personnel and our team's medical team, we have a lot of narcotics and we have all of these um, SWAT officers from various federal law enforcement agencies, one of them being the US Forest Service who they spend most of their time in marijuana grows, not in California. And we had a few civilian responders from agencies like the American Red Cross. And interestingly enough, there's this uh, agreement given the drug trafficking between the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, even though they're US territories, when you, when you land in uh, Puerto Rico, you still have to clear bus, Customs and Border Patrol. 
Well, that frustrated some of us because it's been a very long day and now we have to go through Customs and Border Patrol. And I kid you not, the flight attendant got up and said, I would ask that every passenger that has a gun, please stand up and exit the plane first. Now, I don't think you're ever going to hear that again. <laughs> and, and when are you on a plane that's full of guns and narcotics legally? I've never experienced that, probably never will again. So as we, as we prepare for Hurricane Maria, suddenly we realize, well, we have these some 115 dialysis patients that are in a dialysis shelter that we've been supporting operations with that is not going to withstand the Category 5 hurricane. And so we had to scramble to load up those patients, get them to the airport on that same 737 and off of the ground ahead of the airport closing. We literally had a 90-minute window to hand carry these passengers up the stairway and get them airborne. And then we sheltered in place. Uh, we sat in a big parking structure on hotel lounge chairs for 15 hours. Um, once the storm finally passed, uh, we came out, regrouped, reuniformed, and immediately started doing uh, hospital assessments, started setting up more base of operations, um, back to the Virgin Islands to uh, finish supporting that mission, and then uh, finally we came home. So in, in total, um, of our 85 team members, um, Nearly 80% of the team deployed during this hurricane season. Um, total length of deployment for our team was six weeks. Um, so I, you know, on behalf of the team and the command staff, really um, thank the Citizen Corps Council for that recognition uh, for what the team does. So what do we, how does that all happen? So I'll give credit to Brian Sharon for helping put this slide together. I'll give you a little example of what that all looks like in terms of travel and time. So Hurricane Harvey, Category 3 hurricane, kind of came in and did a loop-de-loop, -loop, uh, threw everybody for a curve there. Our first launch was teammates into uh, Louisiana and then down further in the Gulf states into Texas. Um, then we had some deployment uh, demobilization back home to the Bay Area uh, and then Hurricane Irma started to sneak up. So then we launched personnel to Puerto Rico, then to Virgin Islands, and then we had to launch additional personnel to Florida. Because remember, after Hurricane Irma passed over uh, Puerto Rico, then it was going straight up into Florida. So you have a, a multi-tier theater of disaster response. Then Hurricane Jose came in and caused a scare for everybody, but it kind of went and danced around a little bit and, and gave us some rain, but not much happened from there. Oh yeah, there was Katya who visited Mexico. And then we dropped folks further into Florida and down to the Keys. And we did our loop-de-loop -loop to Puerto Rico. And then Maria came and visited us and back to the Virgin Islands. Started sending some folks up to Alabama and then demobilization started to occur. And then we finally got everybody home. It was just an amazing whirlwind of activity. Now that's one team. Imagine trying to track the some 50 plus teams and the 1800 team members just from one agency that was involved in this. Now to take this back to, to kind of home base here, every disaster medical team, every urban search and rescue team was at one point during this hurricane season deployed. What would have happened if that earthquake had hit? at that same period, right? So it really brings back the point that all disasters are local. So what should we expect? It's not gonna be easy. It, it never is, right? And a lot of times you're going to be doing makeshift activities. You know, anything from what we experienced with the mismanagement of evacuees in Hurricane Katrina, to austere medical conditions, to utilizing the luggage carts as mass transport as pe people are being evacuated, to in this case you can see a traction device made out of uh, legs of a, uh, a stretcher and then using debris to actually get the, the weight of the traction. So don't think you're going to be staying at five-star hotels. Well, I, it, 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 don't spoil the don't spoil it and and I'll tell you uh, in terms of lessons learned um, luggage belts in airports 
can be very, very comfortable. Also, the, the, the luggage conveyors that take the luggage up to the plane, also very comfortable. And don't think that if you're going to a big disaster in the south in the summer, that you're not going to need a warm sleeping bag. Because in this kindergarten, FEMA was able to drop a generator and crank their air conditioning back on. And that was one of the coldest nights I've ever experienced. It's not going to be a luxury resort. Whether you're sleeping on the floor in a closet or the front lawn of the U.S. Embassy. But amazingly enough, and I, I didn't put the picture in there because I didn't want to give you the wrong idea. After the nine days on Virgin Islands and the eight hours, 12 hours in the stinky airport, just dripping in sweat, we finally get back to Puerto Rico. And the only hotel that had rooms left was the Condado Vanderbilt a five-star luxury resort hotel. I slept so good that night. <laughs> and if you have to ride out a Category 5 hurricane, you want to ride it out in a five-star hotel. <laughs> they really did it right. So remember, all disasters are local. So here, you know, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, they're putting out on the daily news um, scarce hours, scarce goods on St. Croix. There was curfews in place uh, throughout the disasters. Um, amazingly enough, I think it was during one of the playoff regions, they opened up the curfew hours a little bit so people could go watch the game, but that's another story. Um, and then, you know, here in the Bay Area, Scarcity of a different factor. <laughs> now, I, no joke around this picture. So I, I, I took this picture during the Napa Valley fires, and, and I just thought, I, and what I took it as is people were really trying to just support the wineries. Um, but, you know, it, it was just the reality of the Bay Area. Um, I will say with that incident, the hospital, uh, we were impacted by the Napa Valley fires as everybody was. Um, indirectly as the smoke started to inundate the Bay Area. Um, smoke and uh, sterile environments, they don't go hand in hand. Um, so we, uh, we cornered the market basically on portable HEPA filters, and then once we were able to determine how many HEPA filters we needed to maintain operations, we broke off the additional 30 resources that we had, and then we donated an additional 10,000 N95 masks and drove up on Sunday and uh, delivered goods to every single uh, hospital in Napa and Sonoma County. So, you know, it really takes a community to come together and make things happen. But again, it's not business as usual. So the power, the picture on the left is a power pool in St. Thomas. And when you have uh, above ground power infrastructure and you experience a disaster, these lines break. And in this case, you, know, you think about they literally are an island and you have to get that infrastructure barged in from somewhere and the crews and the trucks. And even the same, the picture on the right, I took that um, in San Bruno after the explosion. And uh, I, the reason why I took it, I was just absolutely amazed at the fact that they're they are doing essentially handwork, right? No heavy equipment, no, no special trucks. I mean, they're raising that power pool by hand because it is certainly not business as usual. Um, cash on hand. So we're, as a part of our response, our, where general deployments are two to three weeks, and we're, uh, part of our packing list is several hundred dollars in cash, and then we get you know, per, per diem reimbursement. Well, there's a couple reasons that the ATMs go down. Number one, power. Number two, communications lines. And number three, they run out of money, and the banks can't restock them. So I guess that's three reasons. And as we had a couple points where we were staying in hotels, um, we had to pay for the incidentals. And you know, we would, or, first time I'm not eating an MRE, you bet I'm gonna get a good big hamburger. Well, we couldn't pay for the incidentals because we didn't have enough cash because the communications systems was down, the hotel couldn't run their ATM. And didn't think between hurricanes to go back to the bank and restock on cash. Right, because you have your pre-deployment disaster readiness checklist and you're ready to go, but you have this little window of kind of, I get to sleep, I get to eat, and didn't re-account that, oh my gosh, 
we're low on cash and we're going to be here for another two to three weeks. So where do you find money in a disaster? There was a local federal uh, protective services officer at the hotel. I said, any, any thoughts on where we could get cash? And he said, yeah, go down to the Sheraton, go to the casino, <laughs> don't talk to the young guy at the do not enter line, ask for the manager, make sure you're in uniform, and they'll walk you back to the ATMs, they've got plenty of cash. So we sent a little group down and we restocked cash for the entire team. But certainly that was a, a lesson learned on that one. So preparedness starts with you, the individual, and the families. It's, and, it, and then from there we branch out to the neighborhood. And then after that we get to the business in the city. And the key part to that is the city is going to be recovering the critical infrastructure, and you know, roads, power, and things like that. But it's you, the people that employ and work the local commerce that is really is what is going to allow recovery to take place. We were so fortunate. We were staying uh, in a empty business. Uh, just any, just imagine any company where they've shelled everything out and we've got, there was anywhere from six to 70 responders on cots lined up in this business. And the reason why that area was chosen is because the FBI could secure it. It had, it had perimeter fences and could be secured for all the federal responders to stay there. And it had a backup generator and one working shower. I mean, that is more than you can ask for. And, and a couple weeks into it, there was a local business and the individual uh, was able to get a curfew pass and he owned a very small restaurant and started uh, you know, going to the finding sourcing through the local market and then had a very limited menu, but let us know that he was open. And so before we would go on our shift, we would write a note with what our order was, tape it to his door of the restaurant, and then we'd come back and he'd have, you know, little to-go boxes of hot, fresh food for us. And that was such an amazing thing. And, and and late into the deployment, I said, you know, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for being here. You know, just, it is really great instead of eating MREs to, to have a fresh meal. He says, no, no, you don't understand. If you weren't here, then I'd be at home staring at a dark wall getting drunk. <laughs> and, and it really just, I mean, put it into perspective that, you know, what the, what the people going through in these disaster zones are dealing with. So it's so important as a community to be prepared to take care of each other um, to keep things up and running. All right, here we go. Second round of interactivity. Are you ready? Okay. I have here a simple bottle of water. I want you to take a moment and I want you to discuss with your neighbors what you could do with this simple bottle of water in a disaster. Okay, go. Well, make a sharp edge. Now I've got a nice uh, bladed, bladed weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually made an occlusive dressing with one. Ah, there we go. Really? That, that, you'll need that because I just made it into a knife plate of weapon. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> when I'm done stabbing, you can treat <laughs> You punch holes in them on the cup. All right. <laughs> I failed to mention you have a pair of trauma shears and some medical tape. You need to watch the MacGyver TV series. <laughs> All right. So, improvise, overcome, and adapt. That is really what it takes to get through any type of disaster environment. All right, any medical personnel in the room? Andy, what do you see? Well, well it's interesting because we used to use uh, larger Coke bottles for that, but that's a urine collection system. So a urine collection system, absolutely, with a condom catheter, no less. Okay, improvise, overcome, and adapt. So on the left, did you come up with wound irrigation? All right. On the right, that is the restroom at the Haiti International Airport. Oh, man. Urine collection system. All right. On the left, we're creating, be careful with the knife you see on the bottom of the screen, and here, using the water bottle as a spacer. This was 
uh, Typhoon Haiyan uh, in the Philippines. Okay, so there you see another spacer. Um, what do we see on the right of the spacer? A little uh, eye cup, okay? Or if you had a, a protruding object, build the cup around it and then bandage. Um, this is probably the last time you'll ever see a trauma surgeon in flip-flops on his knees scrubbing a tent, but using the water to uh, clean the surgical unit. Uh, here in Haiti, we uh, had a baby delivered and uh, they stacked the water bottles um, to create the OB bed. Huh. I believe she named the baby Sam under after Uncle Sam. I'm not making that up. Huh. Um, on the right, you see they're using a needle to poke holes to create irrigation bottles as a safety officer. I would much rather see that needle in the sharps container, but nonetheless, um, creating a, a nice irrigation piece. Uh, this was again in the Philippines. Uh, I found myself working in a UN pharmaceutical tent, um, a whole other story about being hot. And uh, so I took the water bottle and I uh, used it to do my counting of the pills and then poured them into the little plastic bags and then we typed up um, uh, translated uh, labels. And of course, we all need coffee. This is the newest one. This happened in the Virgin Islands. Anything that we missed? A few good ones out there, sir. Cut it lengthwise and use it as a split. Outstanding. Yes, sir. You can filter water, you turn it upside down, cut off the top, uh, put charcoal from the grill. Yep, and then make your coffee. Because <laughs> now, did anybody come up with hydration? <laughs> Excellent. So, the number one cause of responder injuries is because of dehydration. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. All right, so we have some more work to do based off of our earlier exercise. Um, there's plenty of tools and templates that are out there to help you be prepared. And then final thoughts, I will end on this picture. So this is my family. Um, and on the right is a card that my kids made that stayed on the top of my deployment bag. As a professional responder, um, it's difficult to leave the family, but they support and understand what it is that we're doing. We're going out to help people. But we're there for a limited time, and then we turn around and we come home. And you come home back to beautiful, sunny Palo Alto. And yet the local communities are still devastated. Um, following some of our friends and colleagues that we made in the Virgin Islands, um, one of them, uh, she and her husband, this week, and the storm happened September 4th, just got into a new apartment that does not have any mold and has a secure roof over their head. So it's an important piece to think, again, all disasters are local. It's fun to tell stories about being a, a responder and going off and doing wonderful things, but the, the true heroes are the individuals who live in that community who band together to pull through and help each other out and then continue and carry on the commerce and their lives. And that is you when it's our turn for the disaster. So with that, thank you very much. We'll bring up uh, Jeff Norris' slide. We're ready to go. Thank you very much. Well, thank you and good evening. I'm Jeff Norris with the San Mateo County Office of Emergency Services. And San Mateo County and the City of Palo Alto work very closely on many projects. Our common border is a creek that you can step across 11 months out of the year. And that one month that you can't step across it, we worry about it every single day that it's going to flood our communities. So uh, we've, we've long known that no one way of notifying the public is going to be 100% effective. And that's why we have to start looking at alternative strategies of letting people know. We're look at, we look at things such as uh, sirens, which at the end of the Cold War, people were saying, these things are obsolete, let's remove them. And now we look back and we're going, gee, those things weren't obsolete, we just hadn't realized how useful they are in notifying our communities. 
we started looking at landline telephones. And as much as they have started to become antiques, and the whole structure of landline telephone has changed dramatically over the last few years, uh, in many communities, Palo Alto, I believe, is one of them, the only copper in your loop is that final mile. It's fiber optic up to that point. So landline telephones, but those are things which a third of you have given up. I did a quick look when you were raising your hands, but that's one of our tools that we use to get in touch with people. And then we've also looked at the traditional strategies. Just plain, oh yeah, I know, I chose that one deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the officer with a loudspeaker or the fire engine rolling through your community or the neighbor who got the word who comes and bangs on your door and says, hey, did you hear about the disaster that's, that's coming our way? So we start looking at it and we have to take a multi-tiered approach to notifying communities. So we've come up with all kinds of great technologies to come up with these notifications. There's the, uh, the Santa Clara alert, uh, San Mateo, the SMC alert, the San Mateo County alert SF, many, many different notification systems. Uh, we've tied into things like Nixle, which is as simple to sign up for as texting your zip code to 888-777. Um, but those are alerting systems and they're prone, they can break. Uh, we've also looked at the, in, the integrated public alert and warning system. Now this is a nationwide strategy that is uh, operated and maintained as a joint agreement between cellular carriers, uh, TV broadcasters, radio broadcasters, FEMA and the FCC. And the idea is you see the crawl on the screen, or it interrupts the sound on your TV to announce the problem. Or it sends a text message such as the Amber Alerts that show up right on your opening screen of your phone. Many different systems, but no one system is going to reach everybody. And we've started to see a trend over the last several years, last decade or so, that many people are getting their notifications from their neighbors and their friends through social media systems. Now, Palo Alto has been extremely um, forward thinking on that. And on that back table, there are, is this card. And everyone should pick up at least one of these on your way out. This has all of the social media strategies that the city of Palo Alto uses to provide news under normal circumstances and warnings when there's an emergency. So continuing with the premise that no one system reaches 100% of the people, we start looking at the different social media systems and we start seeing things like the traditional uh, storyteller system, as I, my colloquial term for them, our neighbor here in Menlo Park, Facebook. This is where people are telling their story of what's going on. And the, internet, the Red Cross operates a web-based system called Safe and Well. And with Safe and Well, you can put in the name of a person you're concerned about, or you can put in your own name if you're in an impacted area. <clears throat> and the, it matches up people who are trying to find out if you're okay <clears throat> with the people who are being treated by the Red Cross. Safe and Well in about 2012 was doing thousands of entries per year. It's dropped to about 10% of its peak because people are using their own social media systems and particularly the storyteller system, Facebook, they're telling their story after the fact. I was on the third story and you should have felt the house shake. <clears throat> so safe and well is kind of vanishing and it's being replaced by Facebook. And realistically, the folks at Facebook should be looking at a partnership with the Red Cross saying, you know what, why don't we host safe and well for people who don't have Facebook? It would be an ideal partnership. Then you start looking at other social media systems and you get the, the more immediate blasted out message that isn't necessarily focused. It just goes out into the aether and people who receive it, receive it, and those who don't, 
don't. And you can track individuals and say, I want a notification when somebody sends out a Twitter tweet. Um, or you can put geofences around it. And so Twitter has started to become a great tool for, uh, for assessing what's going on in large-scale emergencies. Because you can create a geofence, basically chart on a map the electronic area you want to watch messages from, we can put that circle around an emergency and look for keywords. But even if we catch the keyword, it still needs somebody who's reading that message to assess it to see is this is this somebody saying the story again? Is this somebody who was a first-hand witness of it? <clears throat> was this somebody who was on board the train? And this actually uh, became a, a peculiar circumstance in Southern California when one of their commuter trains derailed. The train stayed upright. A few people had some minor injuries. But there's a practice in triage where the first, where the engine captain or whoever's there first goes up to the door and says, if you can get up, come walk over here to me. And that way you get the people with the most minor injuries and you get them together first and you get them out, of, out to where they can get looked at, and, but you then leave the more seriously injured people behind. And this captain stands there in befuddlement, looking back and forth in this train and nobody's moving. What he sees is a lot of this. <laughs> And, and I've actually talked to this fellow. He gets this really shocked expression on his face every time he says this story. He then said, if you are on Twitter or social media, come to me. And all these people got up and walked down the aisle of the train to him. <laughs> social media had shaped their lives to where they were ignoring the instructions until the instructions fit that social media element into their life. And uh, the, the, the expression on this guy's face, if you ever get a chance to hear him talk, it's priceless. But he realized at that moment, and a lot of emergency managers have realized since then, people get into their place in the world and you have to sometimes break them out of that trend to get them to do what you need them to do. Now, theoretically, his other approach could have been, get on Twitter. If you're on train 193, <laughs> the alternate approach to that. <clears throat> so other systems, we start seeing many different approaches. So LinkedIn came along a few years ago, and it was a professional infrastructure. This was where you would post a, a resume or chart who you worked with, and you start, you took that network that you developed three, five, if you're in the engineering field, 19 companies ago, and you took advantage of that network to find the next place that you might be going. Well, this has also become, once again, the storyteller approach in that you start seeing those resume changing over time, and people are now using LinkedIn to say what's eminently happening to them. Not the, uh, not the instantaneousness of Twitter, but they're putting out these messages saying, you know, and, and then on the 18th of this month, I went through this circumstance. Totally unrelated to their professional interests, but it's another source where they're telling their story and putting that information out. This one's uh, Messenger. A messenger is actually a very, very old system. And it's still around, still in, in active use, but it's one of those heritage systems that's still pinging out messages. And a few years ago, they broke its, uh, they broke its code and they stopped it having character limits and they broke the code and they let it have pictures. And it's started to become a method by which people who get dispersed you know, you knew this person because they were your neighbor a few years ago and now they're living somewhere else. You're st it's still being used for people to get in touch with each other. Um, I have a lot of friends in Southern California and in Texas who still use Messenger to let me know what's happening. Uh, one of them being a um, young lady and her spouse who lives in outside of Houston, who when networks started to come back, they were outside of Houston. They didn't have phone or electricity 
not because the storm had gotten to them, but because all of the infrastructure in Houston was damaged. When the network came back, she'd already put a message on the system. When Messenger finally was able to connect to the web, I got a message. So she'd actually put the message out three days before I ever saw it. Uh, but it was sitting on there, it was sitting there waiting to have network to connect through. So Messenger, it's, it's an old system, but it's still very active. Then you start getting into this new class of social media. You start to see live stream and things like Periscope. And live stream is literally small video clips that people can transmit right now to anywhere. It uh, gets archived on the, computer, on the uh, network servers for a period of time. It's frequently archived also on the device that you shoot the video with but it's where you can send an instantaneous video message. And the story that goes along with that one was, I, was, I have a little electric scooter, it does about 20 miles an hour, it's probably one of the most dangerous things I've ever owned in my life. And I connected to, I have a buddy in, in Milpitas, and he wanted to experiment with uh, latency over the cellular system. I said, sure, I'll put on Periscope and I'll drive around the park. So I clip the phone to the front of my scooter, and I go around through the park. Okay, over here's the soccer field, over here's this, and I'm seeing stuff scrolling up as he's saying, oh, okay, what's that over on the left? Okay, well, um, this is, and I'm doing a narrative. I'm doing a, uh, basically a, a um, narrative opportunity while he's looking at the pictures live. So then I decide to go home, and I turn, and I turn onto a street that requires, it's really in need of repaving, and I get to an in discontinuity in the pavement, and I fell out of the tree as I flipped end over twice. So I pick up the phone, and here's a message from my buddy. So I know where you're at, are you okay? Do you need me to send help? Because he watched me crash. He saw me fall out of the tree, and because it's geocoded, he knew exactly where I was. So he could have called the fire department locally and said, hey, my buddy just crashed, he's at this intersection, or he's near this intersection. You know, look, look for the oak tree with a dent and a guy hanging in it. <laughs> so instantaneous video started to become a reality a few years ago. And this has actually been used in a number of emergency situations where, um, actually a local instance, um, we had a fire at a warehouse up in Milbrae not too long ago. And the fire captain on the back of the building scanned around with live stream. The battalion chief who was sitting in front was looking at it, seeing what the fire captain was seeing in the back of the building. So he had that instantaneous idea of how much problem is in the front of the building, how much is in the back, and could have started assessing where to send his resources to best take advantage of those, those capabilities. Uh, Instagram. <clears throat> Instagram's original concept was a photo with one sentence. Because a picture's worth a thousand words, why do you need more than one sentence? And people started using Instagram. Well, Instagram has actually grown a little bit, and once again, they they all start evolving over time. They took away that idea of one sentence. Okay, go ahead and write a whole paragraph. Oh, you don't want to attach just one picture. Okay, here's a dozen pictures. But it becomes another means by which people are sending these instantaneous messages to their circle of friends. And then we start getting things like Telegram. And Telegram came about to do group messaging. Uh, its original concept was that you, it was a, basically a party line, and you would invite a number of people into a group. And it originally was, the original envisionment of Telegram was it was going to be used by companies, different departments, to have virtual meetings. And it diverged from that about uh, as soon as it went available on the web and went to being groups planning when they were going to meet for dinner. And it, it, it found a, a million uses beyond what they originally envisioned it for. But it's, it's a group message strategy to where one person can talk to many. <clears throat> what it lacks is a uh, geocoding. So if somebody says, 
you know, I'm in trouble here, we can't really tell where they're at based on, based on that system. So picking up the slack from where, uh, messenger, from where Telegram had left its business strategy, you end up with Slack coming around. And Slack was yet another social media strategy. And their idea was you got invited into a group and we'd hold a business meeting on Slack. Hmm. Well, you start seeing conventions using Slack to have a different departments able to chat together and coordinate things. And then you started seeing Slack diverge just like Telegram had, and now you see, oh, the department now has a subgroup of the folks who like to go bowling, and it's gone the same path. It expanded the one-to-many conversation strategy, yet another um, um, uh, party line uh, communication system. Then the young folks came along and said, we like Slack and we like Telegram, but it's old school. So they came up with Kick, and Kick is um, one of those one of those things that did not want to be local. In fact, in their in their concept, they want to be as unlocal as possible. So your nearest person you chat with on Kick might be in Great Britain. That's not unusual, um, but Kick groups started to become based on different things that people like to do together. I, I recently saw a, um, there's actually a kick group for ham radio operators who don't want to spin around the dial looking for each other. They throw out a message on kick and say, I'll, at six o'clock in the evening, I'll be on 14.68 megahertz. So yet another system. Then, <clears throat> since we're crowdsourcing information, Along comes another one of our local companies, and they came up with Waze. And Waze was a rather interesting concept, because if you can crowdsource news, why can't you crowdsource traffic information? And Waze relies on positionally aware phones in your vehicle while you're driving, and it charts how fast you're going. So if you're on Highway 101, and you're moving at four miles an hour, they can calculate out, and they've used some very smart algorithms in ways they actually are pre-determining pre, pre, um, pre the impact areas. Because if you've got 100 people driving on Highway 101, and the person furthest south is going four miles an hour, and the person who's six miles back is going 11 miles an hour. You can start building a model and calculating how roadways run. And they actually had a vested interest in creating ways because they were planning how their own buses that were moving their employees would be dynamically rerouted. So if they saw a traffic jam starting to form, they would start sending messages to their bus drivers get off of 101, take Woodside Road and get on to 280. They would start routing them around intelligently based on, so they were using all of the public to collect the information and using that to decide where their buses were going to go. So that's one of those slick strategies that came out uh, not too long ago. Actually, Waze is relatively new, I think about two years. It was in testing about three years ago, but it's been publicly available for about two years. So this all leads to information overload because this is just scratching the surface of all of the different social media systems that are out there. They way outnumber us in this room. There are more social media systems than there are people in this room with ease. And social media starts to become a very difficult thing to uh, deal with. Initially, Public safety started looking that social media was okay. We could push out the routine news. This normal, this thing is happening. We're expecting some weather. There's a trend. Um, you know, this roadway is going to be closed for accidents. And they started thinking of it as a one-way system to push that out. 
Well, about three, four, five years ago, they realized that social media is actually a two-way street. Public information officers, and Ken reminds us that we, without acronyms, we have plenty of them, PIO, public information officers, can push information out, you know, public news, updates, circumstances surrounding an emergency. And the public, if they're analyzing this data, can be sending information back to them. So, but you have different kinds of information coming back from the general public via these social media platforms. And some of it is eyewitness reports. It's fantastic. You've got somebody who's actually there, who saw it happen, who can tell you what they saw in those first few minutes. <clears throat> and that gives you a jump on the, on the problem. Because the better you can assess the problem, the better you can respond to it. But we also end up with uh, rumors coming in through public and public uh, through uh, social media systems, and there's even some malicious individuals who spend send intentional misinformation because there's no gatekeepers, there's no moderators. So. I honestly see in our public information officers and our joint information systems in the not too distant future, there's going to be a split. There's going to be intelligence and analysis where they're going to be, that person's going to be doing nothing but watching social media with a geofence around a problem. And then the general, the rest of the public information office and joint information wow. systems is going to be crafting the messages that they're sending out to the public. You know, take advantage of those, of those many, many thousands of eyes who can see that what's going on when we can't to better assess and build a better model of what's going on. So once again, I'd like to remind everybody, these cards in the back of the room, I wish my county would do the same thing. Um, I'm going to take a few with me and talk to my folks to try to get them to do the same. Please do pick up at least one of these cards because it has all the social media platforms that the city of Palo Alto is currently using. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, did you, we want to open it up for some questions? Or? We'll do it at the very end. Oh, okay, very good. So thank you very much. This is a very Silicon Valley, isn't it, to have a, in this case, a sheriff's OES employee talk more about startup companies than most venture capitalists talk about. So I thought that was nice. So with that, uh, we have about five minutes before I want to bring the two chiefs up to uh, close us out here. But uh, if you have a question, if you could just come up and use the microphone at the front, just grab it. Uh, it's flexible. So if anybody has a question that's urgent and they think the whole room needs to hear it, Come on up or comment from Annette. Okay. If, if not, the panel will be staying here for a little bit uh, for questions and a little bit of one-on-one. -on -one. So I have a question for Tom. Earthquake okay. insurance. Earthquake insurance. <laughs> uh, well, earthquake insurance, uh, earthquake insurance basically covers catastrophic loss of your, your house. So if you think you're in an older house, not very well constructed, probably will have big problems in the earthquake. Yeah, that's a very good uh, investment. But uh, if you're in and you're a fairly recently built house, uh, probably pretty good soil or rock, probably not going to have as much damage as the deductible. So, uh, some people, instead of buying insurance, they think that they put the money into the retrofit of their house. And, uh, <laughs> Very good. Well, seeing no other lights, as I said, we got one. Now come on up, sir. There you go. Uh, what do you think the risk of fire is in Palo Alto after an earthquake? Well, we have some. The second question is how much water per person should we have per day? Okay, I'm going to answer the second one first. So, the general guidance per person per day is one gallon per person. Uh, so you're not going to drink at all, some of that's used for hygiene. So if you have a four-person family, and remember you're, you're planning on Murphy's Law that your uh, aunt and uncle and five cousins might be there, you, you might want to gross that up. Or you've got a, a kid away at college, maybe she's at home when the, when the earthquake happens. So use the largest reasonable number for that. Uh, and Brandon's slide says seven days. That's the bare minimum. 
uh, for emergency services volunteers or those of us who might get deployed or might have to stay at work for whatever reason for a long period of time, I use 14 days as a bare minimum. So one gallon per person in the household times minimum 14. And we have a lot of good details about how to store water, how to acquire it, how to filter it in some cases. City of Pelton.org slash preparedness. Um, as far as likelihood of a fire, and we're going to have a fire chief up here soon so he can add on to that. Uh, obviously, what destroyed San Francisco was the fire following the earthquake. Fires in an urban setting certainly could happen. Um, I'm going to let the fire chief really talk about fire science in, in, you know, in suburban households around here. But what, what happens in the earthquake, as, as Tom mentioned, is you can have the disruption of utilities. Depending on where they get disrupted and how, you can have gas leaks, you can obviously have sparks going on, you can have, you know, you were cooking something, and now you've got a, a kitchen fire all over the place that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So there are a lot of things that can cause a fire, and that leads us to the other bit. The reason that fire suppression is taught in the CERT program is for the scenario where professional firefighters and other first responders cannot get to you in a reasonable amount of time. And stopping the small fire before it gets out of control is really the thesis of that. So I'll let Chief Nicolai answer more uh, when he's up for his final comments. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay, hearing none, let's bring the chiefs up and we're gonna round out the ceremony. Thanks again to the panel. Good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Nicole. I'm the fire chief. Uh, let me just finish up the answer on the, the, the fire and just highlight a couple of things uh, that most recently came out of the uh, October firestorm up in up in the North Bay. Obviously, our biggest concern is uh, you know structure fires and what turns into an urban conflagration after an earthquake. So, as Ken noted, the important thing of securing the natural gas if you have a gas leak. Um, you know, there's some very interesting stories that have come out of the North Bay fires where literally the Santa Rosa firefighters were driving through neighborhoods and throwing hoses and nozzles off the side of the fire engine and connecting them to the hydrant and the homes that were saved in some of these neighborhoods were by neighbors that basically made a stand there. Uh, the reality is all fire services, all emergency services will be completely overwhelmed. That's why what you do is so important. And the comments that I wanted to make to you tonight is, you know, on behalf of the 110 men and women of the Palo Alto Fire Department, we take inspiration from you. And we thank you because we can't be everywhere and do everything, particularly in a large scale disaster. Just like you count on us on a day to day basis, we count on you in the large disaster. Um, and, you know, we love partnering with you and working hand in hand, hand, in hand with you. Um, I was going to. You know, make a couple of comments about uh, you know some of our crews experience in Santa Rosa, and even the professional firefighters. When we sent our first two engines up there, they were up in Santa Rosa that Monday morning by about 9:30 a.m., and so they were up there very quickly. They were on their own. They didn't come up for air until Wednesday. You know, there was the the, the disaster was so much bigger, and and things were burning so fast. They were on their own to find their own food. These, these crews did not come up for, didn't see a base camp until Wednesday. So even the professionals, you know, if, if it's that impacted on us, and we have no logistic support, can you imagine for you as, as individual citizens and, and, and residents? Um, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, particularly tied back into the, the, the social media company, one of the benefits of having a uh, uh, a 17 year old and a 21 year old is you get to see the next generation of social media. So if my daughter was on that train, she'd be on Snapchat taking pictures of herself in different poses and not getting off the train. And if it was my son on that train, he would be using Venmo uh, saying, hey dad, send money, okay? <laughs> so we had a deal this fall where my son's cell phone went missing and it's not unusual, my son goes to college up in Montana, it's not unusual to go a week or two without hearing from him. But I got nervous when my daughter said, he hasn't opened my Snapchat. And that was unusual. So it was like, okay, I knew his phone sort of been on the fritz. And I was able to go on Messenger and see that he had been active, so I knew my kid was alive. 
but literally the first contact you have is on Venmo, dad, my phone is dead, and you send me some money so I can buy my, get a new cell phone. So anyway, um, but to, to, to sum it up, uh, you know, we can't do it without you. We value the work that you do day in and day out. And you know, I'm very, I'm very active with Fire Chiefs statewide, and the teams that you all have put together, you know, through Ken's leadership, through Annette's dogged determination, this doesn't happen in a lot of cities statewide, nationwide. Um, you know, it's really unusual to have a city this size that has this robust of a city effort, paid staff for an OES uh, a leadership team, and then this. This does not occur out there. And it's because of you, it's because of your passion and your commitment to this community. Um, and for us, like I said, we take inspiration from it. So thank you from the fire department. Um, and you know, I, I salute you and clap you. But you really don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from the new police chief, right? You want, you want to hear from the new police chief. Okay, I'm really excited that, that Bob's on board. Um, chief Johnson would come up and uh, close us out. Well, you know, first of all, I would like to say, uh, let's have another round of applause for the presenters. It was very informative. You know, true story. I was announced as your next chief of police back in November. And the following day, I got an email from Annette. <laughs> it was back in November. I just started last Monday. And she said, I need you get it, to get you on board. We've got a lot of things going on in Palo Alto. There's no time to waste. I said, I'm all with you, but can you wait till I get there in uh, January? She said, no, we can't. You need to get busy now. So I walked up stairs, told the city manager, Menlo Park, sorry, boss, this lady from Palo Alto is demanding that I get busy, so I'm going to have to cut out a little early. But, the, uh, you know, it's an amazing thing, the power of people. And that's really, if you think about it in our lifetime, in every lifetime, we come across moments in life that we never forget. You remember exactly where you were and what you were doing, and me becoming your police chief was not one of those moments. But the reality is, in 2001, on September 11th, was one of those moments. And that is what was the birth, really, of the Citizen Corps, the concept. Right? It was a year later that this country realized the importance of mobilizing our citizens throughout this country. And the purpose of that, if you remember, the mission was to harness the power of every individual in this country through training, through education, so that we would be better prepared, stronger, and safer for all of our communities in that moment when we needed to respond. And tonight, I have to commend all of you for being here. It's a Thursday night. You could be home watching The Kardashians, The Bachelor, uh, The Voice, who knows, but you're here. And it shows, just like Chief Nichols said, the commitment of the residents of this city uh, to be prepared. So as your chief, uh, as I mentioned when I was approved by the council, I'm not Chief Burns. I lack his height, and I definitely lack his hair. And the first thing I thought of when they Brandon showed that bottle with a little water is I'd at least be able to get two or three more shaves in before you know I really needed it. So the fact is, though, I'm here for you. I'm extremely excited to be part of Palo Alto. We have 170 outstanding men and women who are willing to serve this community in every capacity. But just as Chief Nichols said, we can't be everywhere. And as I told the council that night, even though most people see public safety falling under the realm of law enforcement and the police department and the fire department, we can't do it alone. It has to be through a collaborative effort if we really want to be successful in helping each other. So thank you for taking the time out. Thank you for being here. And I feel privileged to have the opportunity to say thank you to you personally. God bless you.